I know, I know. How can you answer that question? Because you have no idea what I'm going to say. I always like to do that to people because I like, just to gauge their reaction. Uh, this actually is, is relatively a small thing, but um, I messed up on the date of your first homework assignment. It was due last week. It was meant to be due this week. Okay, so <laughs> some of you may have rushed to get it done in time. If that's the case, well, then you're ahead of the game. I guess that's not so horrible, all right? Um, your next assignment is not due this week, but it's due next week. If you happen to not get that assignment done, go ahead and, and turn it in, consider a due date. I never give assignments that are due the same week that I assign them. I always give assignments due like the following week. So, But I, I noticed when I looked at that, it's like, I think I messed up on the date anyhow. I, I don't know. But it's due this week. It wasn't due last week. All right. Um, I th I'm confused. I, I, I think I did that anyhow. Yeah, All right. Okay, yeah, it's actually due this week. But if you got it done again, you know, then you can relax, you know. Oh, oh yeah. thanks for the stress. <laughs> it's good to be stressed once in a while. It, 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 it's like little stressors will build you up so that big stressors don't bother you so much. It's like lifting weights, you know, give you a little bit of stress here. That's part of our job as professors is to provide you with stress in your life. All right, <laughs> All right anyhow, onward and upward. And we're going to talk about classes today. All right, we talked about classes before. And um, well, well we, we, we talked a little bit about classes. And we said that everything's in a class. Um, again, remember when I say everything for the most part. Um, it's going to be in a class. It's going to be one file per class for the most part. There will be exceptions and we'll, we'll learn a few extra things towards the end of the course. But um, for at least the first half of the course, first third half, everything is going to be in a class and every class is going to have its own file. Now we saw a program last time with one class. Why would you ever need more than one class? Why not just write our whole program, no matter what it is, whether it be a payroll application, or whether it be an online ordering to order pizza, or a student management system. Why ever have more than one class? Why not just do everything in that one class that we created last time? Operability, uh, functionality, maintainability, I was going to say, yeah, it would probably be more of the ability. Because you could probably accomplish any kind of functionality. You could probably do it in one class. You probably could. But that doesn't mean it's going to be a good program. Remember, first of all, let's keep in mind a couple different things. When we're writing code, we're planning ahead that our code is going to need to be changed. Did I draw a graph for you about the cost to change code versus the cost? OK. I do this in like just about every class, and I, I never remember which classes I've done it in and which classes I haven't. There's a very famous graph in <coughs> information technology. And this is true from day one. The world's first computer programmer lived under these rules. And the last human computer programmer before the sun explodes will continue to live under these rules. Boy, that sounds grim, doesn't it? Um, if we're to graph the cost to make a change to a program as compared to the stage of the program, analysis and design are sort of the planning stages. Then we have the create stage where we're coding it. Testing it where we're testing it. And finally, implementation. The cost goes up like this. All right? That's true of every single programmer. That's true of the best programmer in the world. That's true of the worst programmer in the world. The graph has a shape that goes like that. Now, mathematically speaking, and it's been 
I don't know how long since I took calculus. That's a graph that has a positive first derivative, which means it is increasing at an increasing rate. Sometimes people will say exponential or geometric progression. As opposed to a linear progression, it's a straight line. So it doesn't just get a little more expensive the further along line to go. It skyrockets. All right? Why? Well, it makes sense. When something is completed, to go back and to make changes to it is a big deal. Think about if you're building a house. If you build a house and, <clears throat> and you decide you want the bathroom to be 10 foot by 10 foot instead of 8 foot by 8 foot, that would be a pretty small bathroom, but I, I don't know what, uh, let's say 16 by 16 instead of 14 by 14. While the architect is still drawing out the plans, it's not that much of a big deal to draw a little bit bigger of a bathroom, and it will take a little bit more materials, and so on and so forth. But if you've already built your house, and you decide that you want your rooms just a little bit bigger, that takes a mammoth effort. You're already living in the house. There's the inconvenience. You have to tear down walls that are already there. You have to build up new walls. The expense of that is a lot more expensive than when you're planning uh, building the house. And it's the exact same way with software. So anything we do is, that I say is a good practice to do this, what we're trying to do is make our code more maintainable. And what do I mean by more maintainable? We want to flatten this curve out a little bit. We want to make it like that, maybe. There's nothing we can do about the shape of the curve. That's just the nature of the beast. But if we're good, we can flatten it out so it's not quite as big of a jump as it would be otherwise. Now keep in mind that you need to change your software for a bunch of reasons. Number one, bugs. You didn't do something right. You, you added the person's hours and wage rate to come up with their gross pay instead of multiplying them. All right. Hopefully you would have caught that in testing, but you know, a bug. It does a calculation wrong. It calculates the, the withholding tax incorrectly. All right. Um, whatever. Thinking of a payroll application. That's one reason that you need to go back and change your code. But there's other reasons as well. Right? And some of them are not your fault at all. Some of them, there's a mix of blame. One of the things that's a problem is um, if the requirements of the program weren't defined correctly. In other words, you wrote code that works and does what it's supposed to do. It's just that the problem that you solved isn't the problem that people asked you to solve. You wrote the world's best checkers game when really they wanted a chess game. All right, would be an example of that, right? There's no bugs in it per se by the definition of the code not working correctly. You just didn't solve the wrong, the right problem. Now, that could be the developer's fault for mishearing it. That could be whoever they're developing on behalf of. But there's some sort of miscommunication, and you're going to need to change things. The other thing is simply enhancements. Your program works perfect. You did a great job. But now, we want to add additional functionality in it. We want to take our, well, our chess game all right, that we wrote for a computer and allow for online play, for example. All right? Maybe we add a, a game where you played against a computer in chess and you did a great job with that. Now we want to add the capability of online play. All right? Doesn't mean you add any bugs in it. It's that the requirements changed. All right? Um, Sometimes the law changing can have an impact on that. Uh, a lot of the, you know, a lot when you talk about like human resources and um, um, payroll sorts of things, you know, the tax code changes, you know, and therefore the way that you calculate uh, payroll withholding tax is radically different than it used to be. All right, well, guess what? There's no bugs in the program. You did exactly what you're supposed to do, but you still have to go back and change it. So no matter what, if you write some software, there's a darn good chance that you're going to need to change it. All right? You're going to need to fix things. You're going to need to add things on. Um, you're going to need to modify things. All right? Now, what does this have to do with anything? Well, 
given the fact that change is inevitable, we want to make the change as painless as possible. Therefore, anything that we do that I say is a good programming practice, we do in most cases because of maintainability. All right. So, getting back to the original question, why do we have more than one class? If we could do everything in one class, which we can, more than likely, we can do everything in one class, why have multiple classes? Maintainability. Well, okay, that's right, but let's add some detail to that. How do classes, having more than one class, make our code more maintainable? Well, for one thing, it's easier to look at a smaller piece of code and get your head around it than to look at some giant thousands, millions of lines of code and try to find exactly where the problem is or what you need to change and so on. All right? It's the old needle in a haystack thing. You know, if you have a giant program, it's very difficult to find an error that exists in it, whereas if you have a small chunk, it's easier to find what you need to change or what's wrong or whatever. Another thing that you can do is you can leverage and have more than one person working on the project. Right? Maybe one person in a pizza shop is responsible for writing the class for pizzas. Another person is responsible for writing the class for an order. And so on down the line. All right? So you can make it more maintainable by being able to chunk it off and give a piece to this person, a piece to that person. All right? And makes it easier to change, quicker to change. Um, the other thing is, is when you develop code, while you don't necessarily want to obsess about it, you do want to consider the likelihood of there to be future enhancements. So as such, all right, you want to build not just, you don't just want to solve the problem that you've been faced with, but you want to build some building blocks that will make your life easier later on. For example, let's say I were to write a poker game, a game where you can play poker. All right? Now if I wrote that, incorrectly, if I wrote that as just one giant class that had everything in it, which you could probably do, if I wanted to then go and write a blackjack game, I kind of would have to go back to square one and reinvent the wheel. All right? It's better if you have a, th a the thought in your head to develop components that you might be able to reuse later. So, for example, if I was writing a poker game, I would write, I would definitely solve the problem that I was asked to do. I would definitely write that poker game, but I might make a class for a deck of cards. I might make a class for an individual card. I may, might make a class for a player. Not a poker player, but a player. I might make a class for any number of different things that I could then go and reuse if I wanted to add a blackjack game to it. So I wouldn't have to start at, 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 the, at the first square and redo everything. I'd already have some building blocks in, in place. And so for that reason, we develop classes. It's easier to look at little pieces of code, and we're developing building blocks that we can later build upon. All right? What is a class, first of all? We've talked about a class, and we said how we needed a class to run our program, but what are these other classes going to be in the code that we're going to write? What is a class? Throw some words that maybe you've heard about classes. Make something up quickly Google something. Give an answer for your morning class that you had today. A class is an object. That's not really correct. Uh, <laughs> but you tried, so you get credit for trying. Classes and objects are related, and we'll talk about the relationship in, in a couple minutes. All right? What is a class? 
A blueprint. All right, I like that. A class is a blueprint. All right, a class is a. If I was going to define class, good googling by the way there. Uh, if I was going to define a class, I would say a class is a software representation of a particular entity. And you don't have to write this down, but that exists in a problem domain. When I talk about a problem domain, I talk about the thing that you're trying to solve. All right. So, student might be a class. That's something in a problem domain, right? Now, the details of what's in that class might be different depending if you're talking about, like, say, uh, the academic side of a college versus the athletic department of, of, of a college, right? The athletic department might view a student different ways than the academic department would, right? So, therefore, uh, when I say a software representation of a problem domain, I mean you, you have the stuff in there that's relevant to the problem that you're trying to solve. All right? So it's, a, it's an entity. And when I say entity, what do I mean by entity? What would a synonym maybe for, or a description of an entity be? Yes? Something in the real world. Typically it is, or often it is, something in the real world. What part of speech would an entity correspond to? A noun. A noun. All right. And to review this, um, it would be probably a person, place, or thing. Right? So if I was developing an application for our college, what would be some of the entities that would exist in a college? Students, professors, adjuncts, staff, tuition, maybe, yeah, classes, courses, classes. I think you got the idea. Person, place, or thing. Now, it could be something that's fairly um, abstract. Like, for example, uh, a major, right? A major is an example of an entity, right? It, it, it's a thing. It's not like a tangible thing that you can hold on to, but it's an entity, all right? So it's things, entities, people, places, things that relate to the problem that we're trying to solve. And it's a software representation. Now, when we create this class, again, it's important to know we're going to make these classes in a way that's relevant to our problem, like I said before, with the student example. All right? Um, if we were the college's um, athletic department, we would view a student differently than if we were the, the college's academic um, uh, departments. All right? So, we set a blueprint. A class is meant to represent everything that for our problem is important about that entity and provide a blueprint. So, what would be something in, let's say, a, if we were doing an a, a, a academic system for Lorain County Community College and we were creating a student class? What would be some of the things that would probably be important about that student that we would want to have in our blueprint? Name? What else? Absolutely. Student would have a student name. Um, what does someone else say? Student number. Credit hours. Date of birth, credit hours, address, and we could go on and think of all these things. All right. What are some things that students could do within an academic institution? 
They could enroll in a class. That's also important to know about a student, that students can enroll in a class. What are some other things that a student can do? Drop a class. I hope that's just hypothetical. All right, I hope you're not so offended by my mistaken due date that, that you're ready to drop. If anything, you should be ahead of the game. Uh, anything else? All right. And I'm going to put this down a couple different ways. Apply for, use, financial aid. Anything else? Okay, um, alert notification. All right, other things, you know, graduate. We can think of all these things. So, a class is going to have a combination of two different things. The things that the entity knows about itself, its characteristics and behaviors that that class can participate in. All right? So, that's two things that a class is going to have. Those of you that maybe have had C sharp, how many of you have had C sharp? What about advanced C sharp? All right. What are characteristics and behaviors? typically known as in programming? Methods for which one? Behaviors, right. Behaviors are typically called methods or functions. All right. And what are, what's another word for characteristics? The variables. And they will be variables, all right. And what, what's sort of the more generic term for that? attributes. All right. So classes have attributes and methods. So a class has attributes and methods. Attributes being characteristics. So in the case of student, you know, name's a characteristic of a student. Student number is a characteristic of the student. A method, you could call it a behavior or a function, might be something like calculate the number of credit hours. All right? Because that's actually a calculation, right? That's not, that's not an attribute like your name is. Your name is just stored somewhere, right? There's no way that, that I could say student number 5992, let me calculate what their name is, right? That doesn't make sense. You're just going to store the name. That's a characteristic of the student. But the number of credit hours, I suppose you could consider it an attribute, but it's probably more of a method because that's going to involve a calculation. What's it going to involve doing? It's going to involve looking at all the classes that you've taken. This is assuming you mean total credit hours. Go look for all the classes that you've taken, maybe classes that you've transferred in from another institution that have been accepted, and so on and so forth, and actually tally up. So that's going to change, all right? Um, and, you know, if I pass a class, boom, my credit hours went up. Next time someone asks me to calculate it, it'll calculate the, the new version. You know, calculate what your tuition is would be an example of a method. You know. So you think of this as being different things that you can ask a member of that class. What's your name? Calculate your credit hours. Calculate your tuition. All right. So behaviors and methods. A good class will encapsulate the 
attributes and behaviors of a particular class. What do I mean by encapsulate? Sort of, sort of, you know, sort of think of like if you were to take a a, a capsule of cold medicine. Yes. Okay, local to that class. That's that's a good way to uh, think about it. Does anyone have anything else to add? When we talk about encapsulate, you know, that means put it in a capsule, you know. Let's imagine that, you know, here's our capsule. This beverage is encapsulated. What does that mean? It means it's all in there. So I go to get a drink from my thing. Anything I want to drink is inside here. There isn't some spilled on the table that I have to drink up or whatever. All right, there isn't some in another bottle. All right, my drink is encapsulated in this bottle, which means it's completely contained within there. So the idea of encapsulation as far as software goes means that everything relevant to that particular entity is contained within that class. So it's not like, gee, if I want to look at a student's library finds, I have to go and look at a different class. That's about a student, right? What their library finds is. So therefore, it should be in the student class. It should be encapsulated. In effect, what we're doing when we're, when we're defining a class is we're creating a component that we can drop in anytime we need to do something about dealing with students. And we can access whatever methods we want to to um, allow that to happen. So it's not like we would have to access a different class to find out the student's parking permit or library fines or anything like that. That should all be contained within the one class. Okay, so let's go and make a class. From now on, for the first few weeks, um, well, for the longest time in this class, we're going to have at least two classes in our programs that we turn in. We're going to have the one class that's sort of the driver class. That sort of gets the ball rolling and runs the show. All right. We're then going to have what I will call our business logic. Sometimes people call them business logic classes. And, or um, what I prefer, problem domain logic. Because not all software is written for businesses, right? You know, you could write a game. It's not really a business. But your problem domain then is a game of poker, all right? Or a game of blackjack or whatever. So we're always going to have at least two of these classes. We're going to have sort of the class that runs and runs the show, and then we're going to have our business logic that does the work. This guy's job is to sort of communicate and control these guys. There's always going to be one of these. There could be multiple of these. We'll start off small with just one, but eventually we'll have more than one. Now, later on, this is going to be a GUI. So if we add a program to order pizzas or calculate a student's tuition or whatever, sort of the driver would be a GUI, where it would pop up, it would give you a place to enter in this piece of information, that piece of information, a button to click on to do its job, and so on. That's what it will be ultimately. For now, I'm going to call this our unit test class. Why a unit test class? Well, because we're not ready to write GUIs yet, but we still want to make sure these guys are doing their job correctly. So we write code to test our business logic classes and make sure they're doing their job right. And we'll do that simply by hard coding. I know hard coding isn't 
good in the general rule. But as far as making test classes go, these unit test classes are going to get thrown away anyhow. These aren't re reusable code. They're, we're just writing them to test our code. So therefore, yeah, we can hard code. It's no big deal. Now, someone had made the point before talking about an object versus a class. What is the relationship between object and class? They are re related, but they're not the same thing. Okay. Okay. Object somebody referring to via the class. Okay. All those are good thoughts. Exactly. A object is a specific instance of the class. All right. So, for example, you know, professor would be a class, right? And in our problem domain, we could define a class for professor that would have a bunch of attributes associated with it. Their name, what degree they have, where they went to school, the date they were hired, what their rank is. All these different things would be attributes of the professor, and there'd be some behaviors in there, too. All right, so that's the class. We're saying that this is what we need to know about a professor. This is what a professor needs to supply to our application. Mike Zellers would be an object, right? Mike Zellers is a member of that class, an instance of that class. So think of the class as being, as was stated, a template. It describes, in general, the characteristics of a particular entity. An object is a specific member of that entity. So, with that in mind, let's talk about a class. And we're going we're to sketch them some things out, and then we'll actually write the code for it. It's important to get your thoughts down first. And sometimes I require that as part of the assignment, to, to talk to me or, or to diagram or something what your classes are going to look like. Let's talk about a subject near and dear to my heart, pizzas. All right? So pizza. Pizza would be a class. All right? Let's assume we're starting a, a pizza shop. And we want to write an application to handle our business. You know, maybe it's going to be, maybe we're going to have it run on our registers, or maybe we're going to create a mobile app, or whatever. But we're starting doing, starting doing some basic things. What are some characteristics of a pizza? All right, crust. So like the kind of crust, right? So maybe thick or thin. All right. What would be another? What would be another uh, uh, characteristic or another aspect of a pizza? Toppings. And we're gonna keep it simple. If we do it with one topping, we can we can see how to do it for all of them. We're just gonna say our pizza shop is gonna be it's gonna be like those pizza shops. I don't know, like if you ever gone to the zoo or or. Uh, whatever, where they like, you got, you got cheese or, or pepperoni, all right? So either plain or pepperoni. So, has pepperoni will be a characteristic of this pizza. What's another characteristic of it? Size. Size. We'll say small, medium, or large. I want to do enough of this to be representative, all right? Um, as opposed to, you know, solving the world's pizza problems, all right? What's another characteristic of this pizza, let's say? Sauce. sauce? Let's just assume it's going to have sauce. Price. Price. All right. What's another characteristic? 
Okay, pickup or delivery, that's a good one, but let's save that for when we talk about an order. Because an individual pizza, that's, an a, that's more of an attribute of the order than... So it would be very unlikely that I would call in and order three pizzas and say, well, this one I want delivered, <laughs> and these two I'll come and pick up, you know. All right, so we'll, we'll leave that one to go. The other thing I'm thinking about is bake time, right? Uh, a thicker pizza would probably take longer to bake than a thin pizza, I would think. I don't know. And maybe even a large, thick pizza would take longer than a small, or, uh, small thick pizza. All right? So we're going to say bake time. Which of these do you think we're going to need a function or method for? Which of these things do you think are going to be calculated as opposed to simply having a value? The bake time is probably going to be a calculation. And let's just say, to keep it simple, that thick cross take 16 minutes and thin take 10. I'm not a pizza chef, so if these numbers are wrong, and if you burn your pizza when you go home tonight and try to follow my instructions, don't blame me. This is a disclaimer. All right, I'm just making these up. But that's a calculation. In other words, it depends on other attributes. All right, so this could be a method. Now, sometimes in object-oriented terms, we sort of personify these objects. And we say, like, we ask the pizza how long it will take to bake. And that kind of sounds weird at first, but what that means is, is that entity of pizza has a calculation associated with it that can determine the bake time. Yes? Um, you just talked about how small Yeah, we, we, we should, but, but we'll, we'll simplify it. We'll just say thin and thick for now. What else is probably something that we're going to calculate? Price. Because... Small is $8, medium is 10, and large is 12. And then we add $2 for pepperoni. All right. These other things, there's really no way to calculate it, right? We are going to set those attributes. We're going to define those attributes. Now, again, we're creating now the generic class. Later on, we're going to create individual objects, that is, members of that class. So we're going to create a small pizza, no pepperoni, thin crust. Like maybe that's what I ordered today. Another customer orders a large, thick crust with pepperoni. Each one of those is going to get its own object. All right? And that object will be able to do the specific calculations relevant for the particular attributes. So let's go in and let's actually code this class. And I'm going to code the class. And I want to get through at least the very basics of this one um, before we're done with lecture today. So bear with me if we go a little bit over. I think someone shut the computer down. Let me boot. That's weird. I just had a class from 9 to 10. I'm surprised. Someone must have uh, reboot it. rebooted it. I'm sorry, what was it? Okay. Oh, all right, right, exactly. All right. So these things are going to be attributes. One thing in Java is all our attributes have types associated with them, data types. I assume from C Sharp, which you've all have taken, and you've all admitted to taking, all right, 
that you know something about data types. What data type would these things likely be? Size and crust. String. We're going to keep it simple and make them strings. What is has pepperoni going to be? Probably a boolean. A string is simply a collection of characters. All right. Now again, we know that we want those characters to be thick and thin, and that's the only two possibilities. And we want the size to be S, M, or L. But right now we're not worrying about validation. All right. Remember, we've got to walk before we can run. So we're just going to uh, make sure everything works uh, you know, we're, we're going we're gonna to forget the fact that you need to validate this stuff, and we'll come back to that later on. Pepperoni, on the other hand, only has two possible values. Either you have pepperoni or not. All right? And before anyone asks, we do not offer double pepperoni as a topping. All right? You just don't. You just can't get it. All right? Okay. So let's go and build this class. I'm going to download the Hello World class just to give me a starting point. And I'm going to make my pizza class. All right, I'm going to edit this guy, and I'm going to get rid of the comments since that's no longer relevant, and I'm going to get rid of this because it's no longer relevant, and I'm going to call this unit test. Okay. All right, and I'm going to go and do a save as unit test.java. Again, the and then I'm going to do a save as and save a copy as pizza.java. All right. So the way we do it is we're going to have, first of all, our attributes. Our attributes consist of three, possibly four things. They, they represent um, the visibility of the attribute that is public or private. There's a third one, protected, that we're not going to get to today. Then we have the type of the attribute, and then we have the variable name. Optionally, we can set a default value as well. All right? So, I'm going to say private. String size. And for now, I'm not going to put any, de any defaults in here. We'll talk about defaults at a later time. Private string crust and private boolean 
has pepperoni. We make these private. What does that mean that we make the attributes private? Can only be accessed within this class. Well, how are we going to be able to create a pizza and tell the pizza that it's small then, or tell the pizza that it has thick crust or thin crust or whatever, if we make it private? Well, we, we have to, when we create this pizza, we have to somehow let the pizza know that this is a small pizza, so it knows how to do the calculation for the amount. Likewise, we have to somehow tell the, the pizza that it's going to be a thick crust or a thin crust or whatever. So if no one can access these variables except inside this class, how do we give these variables values? We do it via methods. As a general rule, your attributes are going to be private, and you're going to have public methods that allow people to set and access those methods. Setters and getters sometimes are, they're called. Modifiers and accessors, I think they might be called by other people, and so on. What's the reason behind that? Why make it private and then use a method to set the, the value of that variable? What's the reasoning behind that? Exactly. We're controlling the manner in which this attribute is accessed. We're only allowing one way to access it, so we have control. So later on, if we wanted to add validation that said size of the pizza can only be SM or L, all right, there's only one place we need to put that validation, and it'll be handled. If we made the variables public, then any other class could set the size to anything the people want, the, anything the application or anything that other class wanted to. Could set a, uh, the, the value of the size to kind of big or a tiny or gigantic or something that our application wouldn't be able to handle. So therefore we make the variables, we make the attributes private and we control their access through the use of methods and in that way, we can better ensure the integrity of the data. So for every one of these attributes, we're going to have two methods. We have a getter and a setter. The setter sets the value. And it's going to look like this. Public void. Void meaning it doesn't return anything. Set size. It's going to accept as an argument a string. And all it's going to do is take the variable that was given and set the size to that variable. Let's make sure we understand what this function says. Public means that the outside world can access it. Oh, so this is how the outside world accesses that variable. It uses the method to do that. All right? Think of this as sort of like the headphone jack on your computer. It's, it guarantees that you hook up your headphones in the right way, that you don't have to crack open the machine and solder your headphones onto the motherboard, right? Because that's risky, and you're going to mess something up if you try that. Whereas you're given a way to do it. You're given a very controlled way of accessing that property, and that's through a set method. Public means anyone can access it. Void means this, ver this uh, method doesn't return a value. This is the name of the function, and we are giving it an argument that is a string.
We're going to have the same sort of thing for crust. And has pepperoni with the difference of being that the argument for has pepperoni has to be a boolean. We're not going to complete this class today, but I do want to do the get methods. The get method is sort of the flip side of the set method. We have a method that other classes can use to assign values to these variables. We need methods to get the value of the variables out. Because again, we're not going to allow the outside world to have access to these attributes. And therefore, we're going to have a get method. That all it does is it returns a value of the size. And get crust returns a value of the crust. And finally, return or get has pepperoni. It's going to return a boolean. And it's going to return the value of our attribute has pepperoni. So for every attribute, we're going to have one of these and one of these. Again, for the most part. You can almost hear the words for the most part behind any sentence I give. All right? Because, you know, it's a big world out there. There's always going to be some exceptions. These methods allow us to set. If you don't mind, I'd like to go maybe a couple more minutes, bite into your lab time just a little bit, just to finish this, because I, I would like to do um, just the calculation for, ha for the price and show you how to write the unit test. I said a lot of things. I'm not really sure what, what you're asking. Private attributes. Every attribute will have a set function and a get function. One is used to assign a value. The other is, is used to access the value. So I'm going to create a function. It's going to return a double. Calculate price. Or let's calculate bake time. That one's easier. All right. And what I said is, if I remember right, I said if crust equals thin Bake time equals 10 minutes. Otherwise, bake time equals 16 minutes. All right. So we have these two things. We have our unit test, 
which I unfortunately just saved over. I want to do a save as and save it as pizza. I'm now going to create my unit test. Again, we have to have one class that has the main in it. I'm going to create a pizza. How do I do that? I'm going to say pizza p equals new pizza. That creates a pizza object, a member of the pizza class, a specific pizza that someone could eat, all right, as opposed to class, which is a generic description, a blueprint for a pizza. I am now going to set the different values p dot set size large p dot set crust thin P dot has pepperoni or set has pepperoni false. So what am I doing? I'm giving the values for this attributes. I've created a pizza, but that pizza is a blank slate. I haven't said anything about the pizza. I am then setting the attributes using the set methods. because That's the only way we can access those attributes. Now that I have set those attributes, I can ask the pizza, how long is your bake time? So I can say system dot out dot print ln bake time is and I can concatenate on that p dot get or calculate bake time. All right. Let's check this out. See if it works. We'll go to my command line. <laughs> this now this is a different machine. I wonder if it has Java installed now. Oh, it does. Well, that's a shocker. Clear screen. Okay. Java C unit test dot Java. It does its thing. And it tells me that there's an error in this. So let's go and look at it. Oh, this should be arg. Error 40 is missing a return statement. Ah. I forgot to give return to bake time. Couple of rookie mistakes. All right, it compiled cleanly. Now notice that I didn't have to compile pizza separately. 
The Java compiler is smart enough to know, hey, unit test uses a pizza class, so I better compile that one too. So now I go and run unit test. And lo and behold, it tells me the bake time is 10 minutes, which is what it should be, right? Because it's thin crust. I realize I sort of rushed through that last piece just to get it in because I didn't want to like leave in the middle of this. I wanted to get so far through. So we will go over this more detail on Wednesday. What I'd like you to do is take a look at this code and study it. Um, your assignment, again, um, is we can talk about the assignment on Wednesday. Um, you could start working on that if you want to or you could spend your time um, working on this, uh, just reviewing it, making sure you understand how it works. Even try to add the calculate price method based on what I said before, that $8, $10, $12 for small, medium, and large. All right, I will zip this up and upload it. We'll see you up in lab. Questions? It should be, yeah. All right. Oh, really? What time did you look yesterday? Okay, because I did it sometime yesterday. So if you don't see it, let me know. All right.